Welcome again to the continuation of our teaching on the office of the prophet as we look at characteristics of a prophet. Our key scripture, Ephesians 4 verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. We are continuing as we look at the spiritual and personality characteristics of a prophet. We are looking at 12 of them, 12 traits that define the prophet and his personality and his char and the characteristics that we might find within the prophet. These make the prophet unique. Uni they, uh, makes the prophet uniquely the kind of person that God wants him to be. And all of these characteristics are built on the foundation of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. This is the foundation on which all of these characteristics are built. This week, we're going to be looking at discernment and discretion, sold out to God, good listeners, and spiritually wise. I want you to go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 51 to 55, and also the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 17 to 18. Now, Luke, chapter 9, 51 to 55, it says, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was as though it would go, he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them. And said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Let's read Acts chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. It says, the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God which show us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Hallelujah. Now we're going to be looking at some things here now. Let's dive into this. The prophet is one who operates with what I call discernment and discretion. When we speak of discretion, it is the ability to decide what should be done in a particular situation. However, discretion is not disconnected from discernment, which is the ability through the Holy Spirit to recognize, perceive, or distinguish which spirit is behind the scenes operating. The prophet must therefore develop what I call a level of patience that allows him, and I'm using this pronoun universally, that allows him to examine a matter before he acts. Now, this is necessary because by nature, the prophet, when he speaks, or when he acts, he brings the supernatural into play whenever he's doing something, whenever he's carrying out his ministry or his work. And more so, the prophet brings the integrity and the character of God on the line when he speaks. This gets even more serious, seeing that emotions and the prophetic are highly connected. And once something is done or said by a prophetic voice or a prophetic office, 
it becomes difficult to reverse it. The prophet's actions becomes a precedent. This is why James and John pointed to what Elijah did as justification for what they wanted to do. Prophets must learn the dispensation in which they are operating. Prophets of law versus prophets of grace have different spiritual laws that govern their operations. The prophet requires the characteristics of discernment and discretion so that he does not take foolish decisions or act foolishly because of a lack of understanding. I want to point out some things to you from the book of Luke chapter 9, from verse 51 to 55. We're going to get into this. Now, just before I get into that, in Acts chapter 16, we read that Paul turned to a young girl and rebuked a spirit out of the young girl that was prophesying something accurately. Some people would have been offended at what Paul did. But the Bible was very clear that Paul did not turn to the girl. He turned to the spirit. And this is a point where you should make a distinction so that you do not become offended when a prophet begins to speak in manners that are different from what you are used to or address situations in a way that you are not accustomed to. Is he addressing the young lady or is he addressing a spirit? What about Jesus? Was he addressing a spirit in James and John or was he addressing James and John? Let's look at some things now as we go along luke chapter 9 verse 51 to 55 the time for jesus to be removed from the earth and to go back to heaven was fast approaching this is why jesus set his face to go to jerusalem we spoke about jesus the ultimate prophet who was able to control time and events in his favor it was at Jerusalem that he would make his voluntary sacrifice. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus laid down his life and took it back up again. However, Jerusalem was a danger zone for him. They didn't like him. They often sought for opportunities to kill him. Yet he was going there. If he stayed in the city of the Samaritans, in the Galilee, Jesus would have been fine. He was safe in the Samaritan city. He was safe in Galilee. However, Jesus was in control of his destiny and Jerusalem was his final stop. Although Jesus knew the danger of Jerusalem, he was not afraid to go. Prophets are not afraid when they are given a word and an instruction from God to do something, that is where their boldness comes from. Jesus knew that he had to make provisions for himself in Samaria because of how they viewed the Jews and how the Jews viewed them. Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. We would call that half breed. They came about when Jews and Samaritans married each other in the Assyrian invasion of the Northern Kingdom in 721 BC. That's a long time. Samaritans had their own religious system and their own unique way of worship. That is why when Jesus engaged the woman at the well, she engaged in a conversation about worship because that was the contention between Jews and Samaritans. Now let's go a little bit further. The Samaritans were not hospitable or kind to Jesus 
because he was going to Jerusalem. Why no kindness? They were not kind because they wanted Jesus to stay in Samaria and validate their system of worship and their place of worship. John 4 verse 19 to 23. Read it. The Samaritans favored Mount Gerizim. The Jews favored Jerusalem or Mount Zion. The Samaritans wanted Jesus, a rabbi, a great teacher, a prophet, to validate them. But because he was bent on going to Jerusalem, they wanted nothing to do with him. And so they rejected him because in their mind, he rejected their mountain of worship. So it was on the basis of this rejection that the disciples who were full-blooded Jews, now catch the picture of what is going on, they wanted to call down fire to destroy them. Now picture what is happening. Half-breed Jews wanted Jesus to validate their mountain of worship, which the disciples, James and John, did not agree with because they were full-blooded Jews. And so they wanted Jesus to prove their point. And the Samaritans wanted Jesus to prove their point. What a position to be caught in. Jesus is always getting himself in the middle of controversy. Isn't that how prophets operate too? Always in the middle of some kind of doctrinal controversy. Some kind of issue. Cultural controversy. Cultural issues. So, let's look at a few things here. The Samaritans wanted Jesus to validate them. But because he did not stay with them. He was going to Jerusalem. They rejected him. It was on this basis. James and John wanted to destroy them. After all, the Samaritans are mixed breed. Now this is where the disciples failed. This is where James and John failed. So let me give you five things that you're going to see in this. Number one, and I'm talking to prophets and prophetic people. As a prophet, you cannot, let me emphasize this, you cannot be tribal, classist, racist, prejudiced, stereotypical, religious, or sexist. You simply cannot discriminate. In Jesus, there is no discrimination. Hmm. Hmm. Oh boy. There is no class, no race, no prejudice, no stereotype, no sexism, no, no religiousism. No, none of that. You cannot discriminate in Jesus. If you're a prophet, called by Jesus, sent by Jesus, there is no discrimination. Number two, as a prophet, you must discern people's weaknesses and see them through the lens of mercy. Let me say this again. We're dealing with discernment and discretion. As a prophet, we're dealing with the prophet of the ascension. We're dealing with the prophets of Jesus Christ. We're dealing with the prophets of the dispensation of grace. As a prophet, you must discern people's weaknesses and see those weaknesses through the lens of mercy. Number three, as a prophet, you must be quick to discern error. Do not let people trap you in their doctrines and dogmas that elevates a cultural superstition above the will, mercy, and love of God for all people. Culture is not greater than scripture. Let me say this again. Culture is not greater than scripture. It could be your, your tribal culture, your country's culture, your church culture, your family's culture, whatever culture, it is not greater than scripture. Scripture is greater than your culture. Number four, as a prophet, 
Be ready for people to reject you because you do not agree with their doctrines and their ways of thinking. Be ready for people to reject you. Number five, as a prophet, understand that people may want, to, want you to side with them so that they can validate their selfishness or their spiritism and hate towards others. As a prophet, stand for truth. Let me say it again. As a prophet, people will want you to side with them because of who you are and who you represent. You are the voice of God in the now. And they will want you to side and validate their selfishness or their wrong interpretations, their culture, their dogmas. Because of their hate towards others or their dislike for others. No, stand on the side of truth. In the story of Luke chapter 9, James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven. Because the Samaritans rejected Jesus. Now on the surface that looks nice. They rejected Jesus. Thunder fire. They rejected Jesus. Holy fire. They rejected Jesus. Hell fire. That on the surface. That, that looks nice on the surface. They realized when they spoke. That Jesus was not pleased. With what they were saying. And so they sought to use the story of the great prophet Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 10 to 12, to justify their presuppositions, to justify their actions, to justify their prayer of hate, to justify asking God to be their hitman to destroy the Samaritans. It wasn't about temple and altar and worship and mountain. No, they hated the Samaritans, they were carrying a spirit of hate in their heart for a people they did not like because they had an egotistical mindset that they were better than others. Is that not how religious people operate? Now we, we go, we're going to tear some things apart tonight because if you're going to be a prophet of Jesus, you must be pure. You must love all people. When they sought now to use the Bible to justify the position of their heart, Jesus quickly discerned what was happening. Because you've got to understand, James and John are no simple disciples. Jesus went up to the mountain and he took with him. Peter, James, and John. These were the three men that encountered the mountain of transfiguration. These were the three men that heard the voice of the Father, Almighty God. These were the three men that saw the Shekinah glory. These were the three men that wanted to build altars on, on the Mount of Transfiguration. These were the three men that saw Moses and Elijah. Come on. These are not normal men. If these guys wanted to call down fire, they could They wanted to weaponize the anointing by God Almighty. They wanted to weaponize the anointing to destroy a people that did not agree with them. Mr. Prophet, Madam Prophet, that's wrong. Weaponizing the anointing for your own purpose is error. It is spiritual error. So Jesus responded to them and said, you, James and John, I'm talking to the two of you, you, James and John, including all you Jameses and Johnses that are present in this generation now, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. So what can we learn from this? response eight things i want to give to you no not eight 
I'm going to give you 14 things, sorry, that I want to bring to you out of this. Number one, prophets must have a pure heart towards people, even the ones that reject them. Let me say it again. Prophets must have a pure heart towards people, even the ones that reject them. Rejection is a function of the prophetic office. Let me say it again. Rejection is a function of the prophetic office, just like persecution is a function of the apostolic office. Rejection is a function of the prophetic office. Number two, not everybody will accept you. Mr. Prophet, Mrs. Prophet, <laughs> you're not going to be accepted by everybody. Number three, our aim is not to be biblical. James and John were biblical. Our aim is to be Christ-like. You've you've been hearing me say this. It's not about being biblical. There are too many biblical people around, but too little Christ-like people. Our aim is not to be biblical. It's in the Bible that Elijah called down fire. That was okay in the dispensation that it was in. But now in the dispensation we are, it's not. Our aim is to be Christ-like. Jesus in me at work. Number four. Discerning why people do what they do will allow us to apply proper judgment. Discern why people do what they do before you apply judgment. Number five. Mr. Prophet, do not act on impulse or emotion. <laughs> No, your actions must be led by the instruction of the word of God in the now moment. Number six, the one who has power must be more controlled than those who do not have it. Real power is not the demonstration of power, but the control of it. Could Jesus call down fire on Samaria? Just like he allowed fire and brimstone to come down on Sodom and Gomorrah, he could have brought it down on Samaria easily. He had the power to do it. James and John had access to the anointing to weaponize it. But we must be in control of the power that we have received. Number seven. Do not seek to justify a bad heart with biblical examples. You are misrepresenting scripture. The Bible is not your justification for an untransformed heart that wants to weaponize the anointing and the office. Do not seek to justify a bad heart with biblical examples. You are misrepresenting scripture. The Bible is not your justification for an untransformed heart that wants to weaponize the anointing and the office. Number eight. Simply because something is recorded in the Bible does not give us license to practice it. <laughs> All things recorded are truly recorded, but all things are not for our practice. The love of Christ informs our actions. Let me say it again. The love of Christ informs our actions. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Number nine, check your heart towards those who reject you. Do you have hidden motives of revenge against them? Why are you angry? 
Why do you want to see them perish? Why do you want to see them die? What is your motive? Check your heart. Number 10. Don't minister to people if you're not prepared to have them reject you. Being able to handle rejection by people you care about or people you are sent to serve is a sign of maturity in love and an understanding of Christ's mission through you. Handle rejection with love. Number 11, as a prophet, you must check your spirit. Do you love people or do you love revenge? What is your motivation for wanting the power, for wanting the gift, for wanting the anointing, for wanting to sit in the office? What's your motivation? Number 12, as a prophet, do not mask your hate, your dislike, and your prejudice for other people under the cloak of zeal for God. God can defend himself. Huh. Let me say it again. Don't mask your hate, your dislike, your prejudice hmm? for other people under the cloak of Zeal for God. Hey, God can defend himself. If someone is a God, they can defend themselves. They don't need you to defend them. Let's read Judges 6, verse 31. This is the story of Gideon. Hear what was said about Baal. Listen what the Bible said. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it is yet morning. If he be a God, let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. In other words, the principle is, if Baal is a God and somebody did something to offend him, he can defend himself. Likewise, if Jehovah be God, and somebody did something against him. He can defend himself. That is why he has set aside a day of judgment. He can defend himself. He can defend his glory. He's going to defend his integrity. He is going to defend himself. You do not need to weaponize the gift and the anointing and the office that you have under the cloak of the zeal for God. No, you don't. God can defend himself. Mighty God of Daniel. Number 13. Don't try to prove your honor for God by practicing bad religion. No one cares about how powerful you are. <laughs> no one. Let me tell you, nobody cares about the depth of your revelation, the depth of your power. Nobody cares about it. I guarantee you, no, I've been in this long enough to know and to tell you that nobody cares how anointed you are. Mm -mm. Nobody. Mm -mm. So don't try to prove your anointing by practicing bad religion. People, they care about how much you love them, even in their harshest actions towards you. What they want to know is whether or not you love them. They don't care about your anointing. The only reason why they care about your anointing is whether or not that anointing can solve some issue or problem that they have. And once it is solved, if they don't love you, that's it for you. Your purpose in their life is over. They don't care about your power. No, they care about how much do you love them. Number 14. Prophets must understand that discernment of people's situation, people's culture, and people's understanding will inform them as to how to approach people. Listen to me. What you have, somebody else might not have it. The depth of information and revelation that you have acquired, others might not have it. Therefore, you need to exercise patience. Not pity, patience. Let me say it again. We 
prophetic people. We don't pity people. We are patient with them. So Jesus told James and John, and he's telling us the same thing today. In verse 56 of Luke 9, he said, For the Son of Man, remember I told you, Son of Man is a prophetic title. For this prophet, let me just change that around and say this prophet, the Son of Man, did not come to destroy men's lives. I wonder if you're seeing this in your Bible. But to save them. So if Jesus did not come to destroy men's lives, and we are sent in the name of Jesus, in the spirit of Jesus, with the word of Jesus, and the anointing of Jesus, and the gifts of Jesus, then we are not sent to destroy men's lives either. We are sent to save them. So prophets are messengers of Jesus, not messengers of Elijah, Elisha, Moses, or their favorite Old Testament prophet. Our attitude, therefore, should be the same as Jesus to save men's lives. So if this is the case, that we are sent to save men's lives, then let's emulate a few things from Jesus. One, Jesus is patient with people in their ignorance, in their arrogance, and in their religious blindness. So we ought to be patient with them too. Mr. Prophet, Mrs. Prophet, you must understand that people are not seeing what you are seeing. They're not hearing what you are hearing. They're not sensing what you are sensing. And so what you might be saying might be foreign language to them. They don't understand it. Therefore, you have to be patient and loving enough to transmit it. Jesus, number two, is long-suffering towards men. He wants them saved. This is why he will not answer your prayer when you weaponize the anointing against people's lives. The more you pray for them to die, is the more they will live. <laughs> this is why being a prophet is a dangerous job. It requires that you have the ability to bear persecution for the salvation of others. Number three, Jesus is kind and forgiving. He's kind and he's forgiving of people who reject him in their first instance. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter said it this way, and Peter would know. He said, the Lord is not being slow in doing what he promised. He's not slow the way some people understand slowness. But God is being patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. I want you to hear that. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants everyone to change their ways and stop sinning. Oh my God. Just think about that for a moment. That includes the people who persecute you. The people who rejected you. The people who said harsh things against you. The people who lied on you, the people who hate you, the people who do witchcraft against you, the people who do enchantment and incantation. Oh, God Almighty. Yes, he's being patient with them. You see, we have to understand something. And this is where I want you to come to a different level of your faith. Do I know that powers of darkness exist? Of course, I do know. Do I know that there are people who have made alliances with Satan and who are bent on destroying your life like Satan is bent on destroying yours? Absolutely, I know. But you have to also understand that these are people who are being blinded by the wickedness of Satan. 
And so instead of addressing the, the person to kill them, we have to do like Paul and address the spirit. And this is where a lot of prophetic people have gotten it wrong. This is why they are not being victorious in their warfare, in their battle. Because they are weaponizing the office and the gift against the person rather than against the spirit. You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. This is not a warfare that is against flesh and blood. This is a warfare that is against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and spirits of wickedness in high places. And so for the prophet, you must increase in discernment and discretion. Having discernment and discretion is required if we are going to Accurately represent Jesus and handle situations that we are faced with. So we must know when we are dealing with people versus when we are dealing with a demon. Jesus, when he was dealing with James and John, he was dealing with two men. They weren't possessed with no demon. They were intoxicated with cultural hate. And that ought to be addressed. But Paul, when he was dealing with the, with, the, with the girl, with the slave girl, he was dealing with a spirit that wanted justification as a prophetic voice in a region. Know the difference with what you are dealing with. In both cases, the souls of the people were saved. The souls of the people were given a chance to accept Jesus Christ. We must know what we're dealing with. For people, we show patience, kindness, and love. For demons, we rebuke and cast out, while at the same time preserving the soul of the people. Discernment and discretion will help us to carry out a prophetic function in the way we ought to carry it out like Christ. This is one of the characteristics of a prophet that is needed in his personality. Let's go to number 10. The prophet must be sold out to God. Sold out. Luke chapter 2 Verse 49, and he said unto them, why are you looking for me? Now, this, this might sound disrespectful, um, you know, to some of your parents. I put it to you, Jesus was a Gen Z. Yeah, Jesus was in the Gen Z era. Eh? If I ever say this to my mother, hey, Jesus, I getting the right hand of fellowship and the back hand of this fellowship. All across my two jawbone. Yes. How is it that you're looking for me? Why are you looking for me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? That's what he said. That's what the young prophet said. That's what he said. Don't you know that I'm about my father's business? <laughs> oh my God. Now what does it mean to be sold out? Sold out means total faithfulness and devotion to the cause of God. It is a willingness to give up everything for God's purposes and God's will in your life. You are sold out. The prophet has no agenda but God's agenda. Let me say it again. The prophet has no agenda but God's agenda. Let me say this to you. That real prophets, real true prophets... You are not plan like you plan. You know, you get up and you say, okay, this year I'm going to do this, this month, that, this month, that. that. The prophet, the real prophet, he cannot do that. He cannot plan like you plan. Because the only way he can plan like that is if God speaks to him ahead of time and tells him, okay, I'm going to. I want you to do this this month, that next week. That, that's the only way the prophet can plan. 
God's agenda is the prophet's agenda. And God many times does not reveal to the prophet what he's going to do other than he just show up and he say, Mr. Prophet, I want you to go to so, I want you to do so, I want you to do that. God's will is the prophet's will. So what the prophet does is what God wants. They are like spiritual robots. They are programmed one way and they cannot change. The prophet lives his life waiting for and doing what God wants. So it can be difficult to walk with a prophet if you're not inclined to wait on God or do what God wants. If you are not sold out to God, you can't walk with a prophet. You can't be friends with a prophet. You can't live with a prophet. Mm -mm. It's going to be difficult for you. It can be difficult to walk with a prophet, live with a prophet, befriend a prophet. Why? Because the prophet is like the wind. Today is here. Tomorrow is over there. Today is doing this. Tomorrow is doing that. And you'll be like, but this man don't have no stability. This man don't know what he's about. No, he's a prophet. And so this is why most prophets, you will find them alone. Because they are difficult to live with. <laughs> Not because they are difficult people, but because their journey is a difficult one. Let me say that again. It is difficult to live with a true prophet, not because the prophet is a difficult person, but because their journey is a difficult one. So if you are not sold out or willing to be sold out like a prophet, don't marry him. Don't seek to be a part of their ministry. Don't seek to befriend them. Because they will mess up your medulla oblongata. True prophets, they can handle aloneness. They can handle singleness. They can handle isolation. Because their agenda is one thing. God. So don't try to make a prophet a pastor. Or to turn a prophet into an apostle. Or to turn a prophet into a into an evangelist no when that grace comes upon that individual to operate in the office of the prophet please for god's sake if you don't understand it don't say anything about it leave it alone leave it alone because this prophet is sold out no matter what you tell them no matter what you bring to them no matter what you say to them you can tell them you can give them the grandest idea of the most lucrative business deal and you wonder why is the prophet not making a move to catch this investment right now he will not make no move because god didn't tell him it might be successful for you but the moment the prophet who is outside of the will of god goes into it it crash it fail it burn so just learn that prophets they only move when God says they are to move. That's the characteristic of the prophet. He's sold out to God. Number 11. Prophets are good listeners. <laughs> yes. They are good listeners. First Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10. And the Lord came and stood. The Lord came. Means that he come from somewhere. He arrived where Samuel was and he stood. God was inside there. And he called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak for thy servant hear it. Remember, three times. First time he heard, but he wasn't sure what he was hearing. Second time he heard, he wasn't sure what he was hearing. And then Eli taught him the art of listening to the voice of God. Samuel encountered the Lord. Now, prophets have the ability to listen well. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. A prophet will make an effort to hear, not just God, but you. 
So they ensure that they develop their ability to hear God in ways others can't. And so this is why prophets, you will find that they have developed their sense of hearing and their ability to be patient with others is being developed because they are developing their listening skill. So as they are developing hearing God, they are also indirectly developing their patience with others. They listen keenly. So because of this, they can hear and see what others cannot hear and see that easily. So to develop your listening skill, the prophet, hear this now, must love, must learn to love silence, peace, and tranquility. <laughs> yes. To develop your listening skill, the prophet must learn to love silence, peace, and tranquility. Too much noise will affect the prophet. You're wondering why noise is affecting you? It is not because you have some medical condition. No, you're prophetic. If noise affects you, if noise bothers you, <laughs> just know that your prophetic senses are tingling like Spider-Man. <laughs> Yes. True prophets love quietness. It allows them to meditate and tune into the voice of God. This is why prophets, some of them, they love the mountains or they love quiet places, whether it be their room or their house or whatever. They, they don't love too much company. They will have one or two persons that they love to be around them, and that's it. They don't like noise. They don't want you to turn on the TV, the radio. They don't want you to play music that is that, that will affect them. No, they don't love noise. Quietness. They don't like noisy environments, and especially music that disturbs their spiritual equilibrium. They can't deal with it. It's not that they're antisocial. It's not that they're... Uh, more holier than thou. It's not that they are more religious than anybody or spiritual than anybody. No, noise just genuinely affects the prophet. It messes with their equilibrium. So when you encounter a true prophet, he can listen to you for hours and say nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a counselor. I'm talking about a prophet. A true prophet can listen to you for hours and say nothing. Why? Because he's not just listening to what you are saying. When you are talking to a prophet, he's listening in three dimensions. He's listening to what you are saying. He's listening what you are not saying. And he's listening to what God is saying. So you see, the prophet has to develop his ability to listen so well so that by the time he speaks, it is not gossip, it is not slander, it is not tail-bearing, it is not rehashing your problem, but a solution that comes from the Spirit of the Lord. So you might sit down and you might be talking and you might say some things that really affect you. And you would think that the prophet would pick up on that that really affects you. And the prophet don't say one word about that thing. And he might say something about something that you said that you thought is not important. And that's what he zones in on. Because he's listening. And he's discerning. And he's hearing. And he's going to communicate a word that brings solution. That unravels matters for you. They are good listeners. When you find a prophet that talks too much, <laughs> you, you're going to have to question some things. 
You're going to have to question, is this one truly a prophet? Or is this one somebody that really has matured in the place of being a listener of the voice of God? Do they really talk too much? And I'm not talking about people who are antisocial. No, not, that, not those people. I'm talking about people who genuinely care for you and who sit and give you time and listen to you. But they don't talk too much. But when they begin to speak, it's like fire shutting up in your bones. It's like fire coming out of every word they speak to you. And number 12, prophets must have the characteristic of being spiritually wise. Now, Genesis chapter 41, verse 37. Let's read a few scriptures. It says, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom the spirit of God is? He was speaking about Joseph. Can we find such an individual? John 16, 13 says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. This is the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit. Now, wisdom is the ability to use knowledge to solve problems. It is knowing when to apply knowledge. It is understanding being demonstrated in action. Now, the prophet develops the ability to understand matters and exercise sound judgment to bring about the will and the righteousness of God and avoid evil in a situation. So they develop understanding and wisdom in the areas of their calling so that they can be good representatives of Christ in that area. Now, we spoke about the different types of prophets and that each prophet is called to a specific area and will be given a main portfolio by which he will be known. Now, if that individual is truly called by God, and we're assuming that he is, God is going to give that prophet wisdom in that area. God is going to develop that prophet with the spirit of revelation and understanding and knowledge in that area. And so that prophet might be able to tell you things in that particular area that others are not able to tell you, even though they might be teaching the same subject. The prophet is different. He operates with the spirit of wisdom. And so wisdom can come from knowledge. It can come from experience or it can come from the gift of the spirit. Now, all of these three are going to be present in the prophet. So the prophet must go to three schools. I want you to hear me. I'm dealing with the prophet, but I'm also dealing with the prophetic people. Okay? There are three schools that the prophet will go to. Number one. The prophet will go to Bible school. Now, let me explain something here. Bible school does not necessarily mean a structured learning environment like a seminary or a Bible college or something like that. Bible school means that the prophet must be a disciple of the scriptures and be taught the word of God. So whatever that looks like for the prophet, for you right now, it could be Prophetic Training Institute. Right now, this could be your Bible school. I want you to understand that because some people might not have the resources, the opportunity to go to a structured seminary theological college or Bible school. You might not have that. You might get it at some time later in your life, but this might be your Bible school. So that's the first school. Number two, the prophet will go to what I call life school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
life school. Now, let me back up a little bit. Let me deal with Bible school a little bit more. Bible school allows you to properly discern scripture. It gives you knowledge. Bible school deals with your head. It deals with your thinking. I want you to get this now. Let's, let's, let's put this into perspective. Bible school allows you to properly discern scripture, to properly handle the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved. A workman needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what Bible school does. There are too many prophets out there now who are not handling the word of God right. Why? Because they have not gone to Bible school. Nobody discipled them. Nobody mentored them. What they are learning from, what they are teaching from the Bible is their misguided opinions. So Bible school deals with your head. It deals with your thinking. The second school you will go to is life school. Life school allows you to properly apply scripture. Life school, L-I-F-E. Life school deals with your experience. So what, what is this going to affect? It's going to affect two things. One, your hands and your heel. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Your hands represent your actions, what you do with the word of God in your life. And it represents your heel, your walk, your progress in your journey with the scriptures. Life school. It will give you experience. So there are some things that you will not learn by just going to Bible school. You have to go to life school. And so the word will take you to life school because there are some things that when you read it, when it is taught to you, you really don't understand it until you start experiencing it. So life school. And then the third school you're going to go to is the school of the spirit. This school deals with your heart. It allows you to properly develop Jesus in your character through your understanding of the Holy Spirit's workings in your life. You're going to develop character. You're going to develop charisma. You're going to develop gifts. Yes, anointing is going to come upon you. Revelation, insights, and your heart is going to be revealed to you. School of the Spirit, life school, and Bible school. Three schools that the prophet will go to that will develop in him spiritual wisdom. And so here we have 12 characteristics by which the prophet will be known. He's a worshiper, an intercessor. He's a forgiver. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's bold and fearless, pure in heart, trust God. He has integrity, discernment and discretion. He's sold out to God. He's a good listener and he is spiritually wise. This is where we will stop for tonight by the grace of God. The spiritual and personality characteristics of a prophet. God bless you. Amen.